and I could have been there, you know. Like, if I was there, I think I would have been arrested or probably killed. So, I, I, I'm angered, uh, frustrated that I cannot do more. But at the same time, I, I respect uh, everyone doing every little thing they can do in Myanmar. Welcome back to another episode of Global Get Down. I'm your co-host, Teresa. And I'm your co-host, Nana. And today we'll be taking a closer look at recent developments in Myanmar. On February 1st, Myanmar's military staged a coup, bringing an end to that country's brief period of semi-democracy under Nobel Peace Prize winner Aung San Suu Kyi. Since the coup, thousands of Burmese have taken to the streets in protest, and almost 600 have been killed. So what does the coup mean for democracy in Myanmar, and how will the military, civilian resistance, and an incredibly multi-ethnic population shape the country's future? So to help us answer these questions today, we're joined by Isabel Chu, a PhD candidate in political science at UBC, and Calvin Yin, an organizer and advocate for Myanmar Students Coalition BC. Isabel and Calvin, uh, welcome to the show. Uh, do you want to start off with introducing yourselves and what you study or do? Uh, Isabel, maybe we could start with you. Thanks, Nana and Teresa. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Isabel, and like Nana mentioned, I'm a PhD candidate at the Department of Poly Science at UBC. I study more broadly politics in Southeast Asia, which is also where I'm originally from. But my own research does focus um, specifically on ethnic politics in Myanmar. Thank you, guys. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here today. Um, my name is Calvin, and I am uh, a, a political science student at SFU, and I'm also a member of uh, Myanmar Students Coalition BC. It's an a, an activist group uh, formed after the coup in BC uh, to organize protests for advocacy work and for fundraising and spreading awareness around BC and to do whatever we can to help uh, the democratic movement back home. Mm -hmm, for sure. So you're from Myanmar as well then? I am from Myanmar. So I wanted to just start off, I guess, with giving a little bit of background information or context, um, because I feel like Myanmar, it's, you know, it's come up in the news occasionally over the last few years, but for the most part, people don't really have much of an idea of the country itself or or its history, maybe some of the political context that can kind of help explain where we are at today. So I was wondering if one of you could kind of give us just like a brief rundown on, I guess, more of the recent history of Myanmar, maybe since independence and some of the key events that have happened since then. Mm -hmm. So obviously the history of Myanmar is really complex and at the risk of simplifying things, um, I think we can adopt like a state society approach to thinking about um, what has happened after independence. And so on one hand, you have the state, which basically is the military, at least between 1962 to 2011. That's almost half a century, right, of military rule. And we can talk a bit more about the rise of the military in a bit. But basically, you have this really powerful and oppressive military regime that's also very much entrenched in the everyday lives of the Burmese citizens. And so one thing to note is that from the very beginning, the military regime was really isolating Myanmar from the rest of the world and just mismanaging the economy. So, I mean, just to give you like an anecdote of the kind of economic policies that they pursued. Um, in 1987, um, the, the leader at the time, General Nguyen, he basically took out a whole bunch of currency notes from circulations because his astrologer said that, you know, uh, the notes need to be divided by nine because that would be lucky for him. And so effectively what this meant was just like overnight, people's savings were gone. And so this kind of mismanagement really just drove the country to the ground. And in response to that, from, you know, the point of view of the society, we've seen like multiple protests by the people against this um, oppressive military regime, and of course, the biggest one was the 1988 uprising. 26 years of repressive rule and political isolation has brought economic ruin to Burma. Uh, but even after that, in 2007, with the Safran Revolution that was led mostly by the monks, um, these were all uprising that was very much driven by, you know, this sense of anger um, at the economic mismanagement, by the kind of um, lack of human rights, by corruption, um, and and we just see like this. Um, it's kind of response by the people against the, despite 
um, being governed by, by such a regime. The other thing that we also want to take note of when we're thinking about Myanmar is that Myanmar is one of the most ethnically and linguistically diverse countries in the world. But with most countries in Southeast Asia, the borders of Myanmar is not natural, right? It's really a result of its colonial history having been governed by the British colonial rulers. Um, and so because of this, um, as well as a history of domination by the Bomar majority within the country, there's been a history of long-standing ethnic conflict as well. And so this is also culminated in some of the world's longest um, civil war between the Burma dominated military and um, you know ethnic minority groups like the um, Gurren, but also the Kachin and the Shan and the Chin. Yeah. This is kind of a follow up question, but just talking about military power uh, in Myanmar, what has been the relationship between maybe the military and democracy? Because some reforms were, as I understand. Uh, introduced, but it seems like the military has always had quite a big role to play in politics. Mm -hmm. So I think the best way to think about the role of the military is if we go back to, you know, Charles Tilly and his thesis on how war makes states, right? And that's basically what happened in Myanmar, right? It's it's The military wasn't always this unpopular. Um, it really began as an independent army, so the Burma Independence Army, which was working towards liber liberalizing Myanmar from the British colonial rulers and then later on the Japanese occupation. Uh, and what happened was right after independence, um, Myanmar wasn't a parliament, uh, sorry, it wasn't a military regime, right? It was actually a parliamentary democracy. But because of the Cold War, because of the ethnic insurgencies that was going on in, on the border, you also had a very weak civilian government that was fractionalized. And so this same civilian government became increasingly reliant on the military to ensure the unity of the country and stability of the country. And actually in 1958, the civilian um, prime minister, uh, UNU, he asked Nguyen, the military general, to step in as caretaker of the country. And so, although they had elections in 1960, multi-party uh, democratic elections, no one staged a coup in 1960. And basically, that was the start of, uh, sorry, in 1962. And that was basically the start of military regime for the next 50 years. And when they were in power, you know, I mean, we're really talking about uh, a military that has, like, deep economic interests. You know, it has, like, business interests in all the major industries in Myanmar. And... When they initiated, even the transition, as you correctly point out, was initiated and managed by the military in 2010, the multi-party elections, and then the transition to quasi-civilian rule in 2011, right? And before they initiated this uh, kind of transition, they also had a hand in creating the 2008 constitution, which basically safeguarded their role as the um, a key political maker in the country. So as part of the 2008 constitution, they retain control of important ministries like the Home Affairs Ministry, Defense Ministry, Border Affairs. They also have guaranteed 25% of parliamentary seats. And this this component of the constitution has been a particularly contentious one. So we see how the military has consistently taken steps to protect its own, not just political stake, but also economic stake within the country. Yeah, if I could jump in here... Um, that's one of the reasons why it's kind of difficult to understand this coup, because like you mentioned, the 2008 constitution, uh, like you just said, the court of the seats in parliament uh, is nominated by the milita military. So actually, the government, um, correct me if I'm wrong, it's already dominated by the military. And then we have this recent coup um, called the military coup. So it's sort of like a coup staged against a government that is already dominated by the military. Um, do you want to, do any of you guys want to expand on that co complexity a little bit? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I was just thinking about the Burmese American journalist, Amy Tan. She called the coup a stupid coup, right? Because it just doesn't make any kind of rational sense. Um, and I think this goes back, we can have a look at why, you know, the coup happened, what analysts have been saying about it. Um, uh, but first of all, I think it's also important to see, like, what is the official reason the military is giving for the coup, right? And, and that has to do with the alleged, um, electoral, serious electoral fraud that was committed in the 2020, um, elections. Myanmar's army, the Tatmadaw, is there for the citizens, as always. Citizens are the mothers, citizens are the fathers. 
The Tatmadaw always acts according to the law and obeys the constitution of 2008. The Tatmadaw held the election for justice. Uh, for we also need parties, to note that both, both domestic and international observers have not found any evidence for this kind of discrepancies that the military is talking about. So there are really two big reasons why um, analysts have um, you know, suspected the military of, of staging this coup. And the first one is goes to the heart of this, like um, the military thinking that they will not be able to protect their interests. And this is against the backdrop of the National League for Democracy, which is also the party that is uh, founded and led by Aung San Suu Kyi, uh, making repeated attempts to override certain provisions within the 2008 constitution. So, you know, these attempts took place in 2014, took place again in 2020. They're trying to remove this 25% threshold for uh, military seats within the parliament. So that was one of it. The end. Um, in part why the military felt threatened, it has to do with two things. So I think the first is the deteriorating relationship between Aung San Suu Kyi and Ming Aung Lai, the uh, military leader. Um, you know, um, they haven't spoken for a year before the coup. And so there is that um, in, in the country where interpersonal relationship is very important that could have played a role. The other thing as well is that the military was making a lot of noise about this alleged electoral fraud, right? But the NLD refused to entertain any of these um, allegations. So they didn't do like an investigation. They didn't postpone the parliamentary session as the military asked it to do. Um, and I think at the same time, the military was also kind of surprised by the overwhelming um, popularity of Aung San Suu Kyi and the NLD, which just goes to show how detached they are from you know the everyday population in Myanmar. So those that that is one reason why um, you know some analysts have have hypothesized that the coup happened. Uh, but the other reason, of course, has to do with more personalistic um, reasons. So you know Ming Aung Lai, the leader of the military, he is turning sixty five this year, and so he's actually up for retirement. And conventionally, you know, um, if the military proxy party, the USDP. Um, if they had won the elections or they had gotten a higher share of the vote at the election, then he would have been able to transition into the civilian ranks, right? But that didn't happen. The NLD had like a landslide victory at the polls. And so that's another reason for um, that has been advanced as to why the military um, decided to stage this coup. Right. And I actually wanted to go back to Aung San Suu Kyi because I don't think we have really discuss like who she is and like the role that she has played um, in Myanmar's history yet. Um, so I guess I just wanted to ask like what her role has been in the last couple decades, really, especially since the elections in 2015, which kind of were a bit of a, um, a marking point. Um, Aung San Suu Kyi, um, to the world, she's a uh, Nobel Peace Prize winner, human Nobel rights Peace icon, Prize uh, freedom fighter. Uh, who was Aung under San house arrest who spent for years several under house arrest. Aung San Suu Kyi herself uh, once famously promised her people freedom. To Myanmar, freedom she is a human rights freedom. icon, but she is also someone they they personify as as the democratic movement itself. You can kind of tell from all the attention she's getting that these people elections are all about her. her. And, and that is uh, a, a tricky question to answer after, you know, the, the recent... Uh, problems associated with the Rohingya crisis. Are joining in the growing criticism of Aung San Suu Kyi today, over she the treatment of her Is she a human rights icon? Suu Kyi, who has long fought for human rights, has refused to explicitly condemn what's happened. Is she a politician? Because there's there's a huge distinction between these the, the, these two uh, terminologies. And that became the case in, in Myanmar after, uh, after news of the Rohingya uh, genocide circulated, right? But she is a human rights icon, and and she is still uh, viewed as a beacon of of hope, uh, someone who who will always stay in the uh, forefront of the democratic movement in Myanmar. That is what many people, uh, that is what many people believe. And even at this moment, she she's still under uh, house arrest. She's being detained, and it it just reminds people of what happened several decades ago. But what I what I notice, what many people notice, is that there are also growing calls for um, for the population, the civilians, to look past um, Aung San Suu Kyi uh, centered politics after this coup. Uh, and the first reason is because of her age. Many people suspected that 
this election would be her last, and afterwards she would be retiring, and and there there is the prospect of planning um post on Aung San Suu Kyi uh politics in Myanmar. How would the NLD look like? How would the civilian government look like? But amid all that talk, uh, this coup happened, which I I would say which kind of stimulated right, which catalyzed people to to start thinking how should the country be reconstructed uh under a, under a, a completely new uh political landscape and the role of Aung San Suu Kyi in my opinion is is under un, under close scrutiny uh not only uh by by politicians but also by civilians she she will always remain as a freedom fighter a human rights icon a beacon of hope for people especially people who lived in the past uh, couple of generations but uh her future role in Myanmar though she will be respected we do not know if uh she is going to remain as 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 the central figure in in uh Burmese uh civilian politics would you also say that one of the reasons why she's still you know highly respected and is considered you know uh, the leading figure of the movement for democracy. I mean, she's done a lot, of course, but like you said, um, people began to be a little bit skeptical of her role after she defended the military um, in front of the International Criminal Court. But uh, would you also say the reason why she's so imp- she's such an important figure is because of her father, who was a national hero. You know, he... Uh, he was the founder of the armed forces, key, a key symbolic figure who led the uh, Burmese uh, independent uh, independence movement from Britain. Would you also say that that sort of constitutes a factor as to why she's such an important figure? Absolutely. Um, General Aung San, as you know, he, he, is, he is considered the father of the country, not only by uh, civilians, but by the military itself as well. That is one common ground one rare common ground that the uh the people and the military hold i would i it would be safe to assume that they put Aung San Suu Kyi past uh the political realm of of Myanmar they they place her above that as as someone who's nonpartisan but that's not really the case anymore because she is a politician herself she is part of the NLD party and that's where the huge dilemma comes in whether they should uh with uh they should stop uh, supporting her uh, after she de- defended the the military, and whether they should still support her because she symbolizes a much bigger uh, 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 she she symbolizes hope she symbolizes freedom right. The, so I wanted to go back to the coup and talk a little bit about the response to it, both from uh, the people and also the military, of course, because, you know, they're just sort of looking worse and, and worse in their response. Mm-hmm. So in terms of the responses to the coup, I think the best way of thinking about it is by looking at the key actors. So, of course, there are the ordinary citizens, um, but there's also at the political level, the politicians and then the ethnic armed groups and then, of course, the military. So with the ordinary citizens, you know, there have really been two large movements. So one are the street protests that really started as the 8 p.m. You know, banging of pots and pens. Um, and I really wanted to highlight the extent to which these street protests were taking place. You know, it wasn't just in the urban areas like in Yangon, Mandalay, the large city. It was really all over the country, even in the really rural parts and on the border area in Kachin State and Chin State. People were still coming out because they wanted to signal their displeasure at the coup. Um, so that's that. And and the other thing about the protests is that, although, as you mentioned, um, the military has been coming after a lot of protests, right? Even up to today, we are still seeing a lot of street protests, like people risking their lives to go out there onto the streets to make their displeasure known. And the other thing really interesting about the protests in Myanmar has been just how creative and resilient the um, protests have been. I don't know if uh, Calvin maybe wants to just share a bit about the various techniques that the protests have used. Uh, right. Like uh, Isabel mentioned, it's been very creative because, firstly, I think it's youth-led. It's it's very youth-led, and one thing the youth ha- has managed to do is is not make people um, grow tired of of the protests. Because if, if people just walked on the streets every day, left home at eight p.m., come back home at six p.m. at night, shout on the streets, it, it. I mean, it's it's been what I've lost track of time, but it's been 
to over two months. And to keep doing that every single day for people to just, just not work, not be with their families, but but to go on the streets, join thousands of other people, uh, shout the same thing every day, uh, uh, sing the same songs every day. It takes a lot of uh, determination to keep that going. But one way the youth has um, tried their best to, to, to keep people to keep people involved is come up with various ways to uh, express their anger, their frustration. For example, we have the silent strike uh, where people decided not to go onto the streets at all for the entire day. The, the, if, if you saw the photos, the country basically shut down. The economy shut down. Well, it is shutting down, but there are no shops open, no restaurants open. For example, some, some soldiers and police, I believe, they came into a marketplace and they they couldn't go to a restaurant. They couldn't buy anything. And that's that's a sort of uh, a coordinated movement uh, people on the ground are, are carrying out. Another one is flower strike. Uh, just just holding up flowers, posting posting photos of flowers, and and three finger salute. And I think we have a flash strike on on April eleventh, where this time it's going to be in the evening, and the under the un, the entire country has planned to uh, enter the streets with flashlights on their phone, light up the streets that way. So it's it's just various innovative ways for people to get involved and not to grow tired of the movement because I. I I understand it's really uh, mentally uh, draining. It's really demanding, physically demanding as well. But by telling people, look, you can be involved in so many ways, and it's it's in a way a beautiful movement against a really a tragic, for a really tragic cause, you know, for basic, fighting for basic freedoms. But it is it is a beautiful movement because it's youth led, it's so innovative, and it's so unified. Mm-hmm. And the the you know just um, as a corollary to that, the other really major movement that's been happening among the people is the civil disobedience movement. So I'm not sure if you guys have heard about it, but it's a movement that encourages the civil servants to go on strike, uh, to not go into their workplace because they don't want to legitimize this illegitimate government, basically. And this movement um, started off with like the healthcare sector, but it quickly spread across to, you know, the railroad workers, bank workers, um, uh, engineers, and it's so it's been so successful to the extent that a majority of the civil servants in Myanmar are currently participating in the strike, and the governing apparatus is just not able to operate right you know the the um, logistical um, supply chain is breaking down you know the banks are not open um, and there's just no way for the military government to legitimize this rule because they can't even govern the country given that the bureaucracy is not behind them and i think this is one of the clearest symbols of just um, the, the amount of unity that the burmese people have really shown against in the face of an oppressive regime yeah so those are the responses from the the people. Um, but I also wanted to highlight the role of at the political level. So um, those uh, that's the politicians and the political parties. And I think something that is very striking, especially with this particular coup compared to the uprising in 1988, for instance, is that uh, right after the coup happened, and because the coup actually, the military staged the coup on the same day that the new parliament was supposed to convene. So it was very convenient for the military because all the parliamentarians were actually in the capital city, right? So it's easy to detain all of them. But because all of them was also in one single location, what happened right after the coup was the setting up of the committee representing the um, parliamentarians, so uh, in Burmese known as the CRPH. And they were formed with the intention of presenting themselves as a parallel government that um, you know, position itself as a legitimate government uh, instead of the military government. And since their formation back in February, they have also um, um, uh, gone to great lengths to demonstrate that they are a functioning administration. So, for instance, appointing um, an ethnic minority, Dr. Sasa, as one of the special envoy, and he's been going out and meeting with the various um, representatives from foreign countries, but also having a foreign relations office, appointing uh, ministers for different ministries, and even uh, appointing, again, an uh, ethnic Korean uh, vice president. And just very, very significantly, very recently, they've also declared the abolishment of the 2008 constitution. Now, this is a very big move. Um, and also the release of a, a, a interim um, federal democracy charter that lays out the goals and principles for a new kind of political vision for the country. 
So um, that has been the response on the political side. Yeah. Myanmar's security forces shot and killed more than 90 protesters on A 19-year-old Taekwondo champion known as Angel was killed by a shot to the head while protesting on the streets of Myanmar. Mandalay. Violent crackdown on protesters continue. A 14-year-old boy was killed at his own house on Monday local time. More recently, a 7-year-old girl was shot and dead then in her father's house. We also lap. have, I mean, I just wanted to touch a bit, I guess, on just the scale of violence that we've seen, and especially um, because a lot of children have actually been caught up in it and, and killed. Um, so actually, Calvin, I wanted to just ask you, like, how has it been just sort of witnessing the scale of violence taking place in your home country, you know, and, and against especially people that are of your own age? How has it been sort of witnessing that and, and dealing with that? First thing that comes to mind, uh, su survivor's guilt, I would say, uh, especially because I am here in the relative comfort of, of my apartment here, and I've been able to at least study, right? Whereas uh, people of the same age as I am, university students, they are at the forefront of this democratic movement. Um, they're on the streets, they're leading, uh, manning the barricades, uh, literally, French Revolution style. Um, and I think for them to, 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 to put uh, their lives at risk, not just their lives, but the lives of their families at risk and be out there. And for me to witness it from here, it's, I feel anger that I cannot do more. And I, I think I share this, this uh, sentiment with my other colleagues here. And, but at the same time, I, I respect them so much and I have the utmost gratitude uh, for what they are doing in the country. And regarding the children that are being killed, we're talking about children who are in their houses with their parents, scared. They are, they, they are in their houses. They are not protesters. These, many of these children, the least they can do is shout what their parents are shouting. Like, that's the extent of what they understand of this, of this entire issue. And yet they are in their homes with their parents, with their families, and they're getting shot. So, so, so from that, you can just see the the extent the military is is, is going to go to 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 suppress uh, civilian uh, pro uh, resistance, right? They they kill they kill parents, they kill children, they kill uh, teenagers, they kill university students, they kill old people, they kill medics who are trying to help these protesters. Uh, anyone, anyone, regardless of age. Is getting shot because they're speak to, they're simply speaking out, is simply showing the three finger salute. And if you if you saw um, Clarissa Ward's report for CNN, people were arrested immediately after they talked briefly with CNN reporters, and it is very lucky for them to to be released right now. And I, I think they were released because there was so much media media attention. But if there was no media attention, they could have been killed. And we're talking about young people who, 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 who are so passionate. They would have been killed. I, I personally know people uh, who were arrested, who, who, who disappeared for, for a couple of weeks with, with no news of, of, of where they are, how they're doing. They were, they, some of them are released now, but they could have been killed. And, and, and I could have been there. You know, like If I was there, I think I would have been arrested or probably killed. So. I, I, I'm angered, uh, frustrated that I cannot do more. But at the same time, I I respect uh, everyone doing every little thing they can do in Myanmar, um, because it's it's such a historic uh, movement. And I think, as much as they say, you know, people like us here are privileged to to uh, to be able to speak out. I I I I think we are, and we should utilize that position of privilege to do more but i think they also hold a privilege that's something we don't have and that's being at, at the vanguard of this of this uh heroic of this historic resistance absolutely um i think something that hasn't come up to uh, a lot of people's attention is just how multi-ethnic Myanmar is. 
So my question here is, how does Myanmar's multi-ethnic makeup factor into the coup and its aftermath? And what does this coup mean for different ethnic groups? Um, and or how have different ethnic groups responded to the coup? Right. So I think, you know, we need to recognize that the ethnic minority groups are not homogeneous, even in terms of their uh, viewpoints towards the military. Um, so certainly there are some who are staying on the fence because they're like, this is not our problem, right? Like this is between Bamar versus Bamar. But I do think that the majority of ethnic minorities, especially the younger generation, are taking up the cause. And in fact, if you look at the very first few protests, big scale protests that took place in Yangon, they were actually led by ethnic minority women who were, you know, in their 20s, young ethnic minority women. And even in Kachin state, you know, I've heard of like waves of young people who are now taking up arms in the Kachin Independence Army to fight against the military. So I think there is that, that general sense of unity. But at the same time, I also wanted to talk about what the coup meant for like the larger picture of um, national unity. And I think that although, you know, the coup is a really, really tragic event, and there's just no way that you know, anyone could condone it. But at the same time, it, it offers this hope for the country because we are really seeing a reconfiguration of what it means to be Burmese, what it means to be a citizen of Myanmar. And there's been a lot of self-reflection that's being done on the ground and on social media, you know, uh, even among my friends who are ethnic minorities, you know, they tell me like their Burma friends have, have messaged them to say, oh, I'm so sorry because I didn't know about, you know, the civil war that's been going on between the ethnic minority groups and, and the military or young people posting on social media, um, apologizing to the Rohingya. And so there's this kind of like national reckoning. And like I mentioned, with regards to the CRPHD, and which is made up mostly of NLD parliamentarians, like even if you look at the languages, the language that they've adopted, right? The shift away from um, democratic federalism to federal democracy, which is something, which is a term that is preferred by the ethnic minorities because of the emphasis on federalism, um, that has been adopted in the recent charter. And that's, that's really significant. That's a really big 180 degree change in terms of this cause. And so I also wanted to just highlight this, this sense of hope and, and this criti critical juncture within uh, Myanmar's history. Yeah, I wanted to also ask in relation to the coup, um, did the public expect this coup to happen, whether that was before the elections or right after the election? What did the people, was there a general consensus that a coup might happen? Um, and then my second question is also, what 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 is the what are people hoping to get out of all these protests? Are they hoping that the um, that the military will back down, or are they hope, or are they hoping that perhaps they will strike a deal with Suchi? Um, firstly, to answer the question about uh, whether people expected it, um, I, I talked to people <laughs> um, uh, about politics in Myanmar, right, and many of them know that the military is capable of of staging such a coup. They've seen it before, they've heard about it before, and it's and the military does not change uh this strategy regarding politics so far this is this is part of their playbook it's a conventional move but there has been serious question about if the military is brave enough to do it especially after uh you know after we saw a historic landslide victory for uh uh the NLD party and what people expected was yes the military is capable of, of of staking a coup because they're inhumane. They they have no regard for people's uh, uh, demands, right? But at the same time, they thought um, the military will will not will never get the same support they are expecting that 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 the military's uh, political party is expecting. So people believe that this this w whatever the military throws at them. Uh, the luck is on their side. I think that's what many people believed, but evidently the military uh, pulled out the big guns, like literal guns, and 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 are killing people. So, what do people want out of 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 this of this uh, resistance? Uh, it's it's hard to say uh, right now, especially after uh, the federal democracy charter got published. Uh, so I think the the main demand is to of the people is to say back down, 
we want federal democracy. That's that's kind of the core of the entire movement. I don't think they want the military to strike a deal, because if they strike a deal, that that's just bringing things back to things things back to politics before the first of February, back to the uh, back to the political landscape under the two thousand eight Constitution, and I don't think people are going to be content uh, at this stage. Before this federal uh, uh, charter was published, I think there was some debate over should we go back to 2000, uh, living under the 2008 constitution, but I don't think that's the case any longer, especially right now that, uh, like Isabel explained, ethnic minorities have so much more reason uh, uh, to to take up arms and, and resist military rule together with uh, the, Mar- the Bamar uh, majority as well. There is so much reason because because there is the prospect of of a federal democracy, and I and and one other thing to note though is 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 it's the role of the CDM movement. It's it's to shut down right to shut down uh, government activity, but at the same time, what the protests the, the, the what the protests serve is is if if you look at it from a, a strategic angle. Uh, it, if if you look at it as war, what what the people are doing is they're launching, uh, launching an offensive in 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 different uh, directions, right? The the first one is CDM, the civil disobedience movement. The second one is is uh, protests, like everyday protests. The third one is pleading to the international community for help. And I think if you combine all these three, it it becomes very hard for the military to, uh. uh to effectively control one situation, they they are forced to uh, reallocate and divide their resources to handle with three different kind of pressures, external and internal. I think that is very smart. And actually, I don't know, Nana, if I can jump in here, but um, I just wanted to talk a little bit more about, I guess, um, these external pressures and sort of the role of the international community. Um, we actually had a question from one of our viewers or listeners, um, Sam, who wanted to know uh, that given the importance of the region to China and India, uh, whether we could expect any great power to kind of take sides or get more directly involved in the events right now. Or, or even the United States, uh, they have a, his- a long history of intervening in these kinds of situations. Um, could we see some sort of foreign meddling, or do you think it would? Do you think that wouldn't happen? I think just based on the bad experiences of, you know, foreign intervention, I think it's quite unlikely. Um, I do know that the Western countries, including Japan, have been very vocal in putting out statements condemning the coup. And one thing that they are doing right now, uh, targeted sanctions. So not, um, you know, applying sanctions to the entire economy, but targeting the military, their businesses, as well as their families. And even recently, just yesterday, I think the U.S. came out with sanctions against the gemstone industry, which is a big blow for the, uh, for the, uh, Burmese military. But then, um, at the same time, you know, we also need to remember that Myanmar, the Burmese military actually doesn't really care too much about the West. And if you think about like the amount of imports, exports, um, the West also doesn't really figure much. It's mostly countries like China, Thailand, Singapore, Hong Kong, um, that is doing trade with, with Myanmar. So with regards to China, um, we know that Ch- the Chinese have always taken the stance of non-interference, if not to protect its own domestic interests, right? It doesn't want a, a, an uprising within its own borders. Um, I do think, though, that among some circles, there's this um, misconception about the role of Chinese um, within the coup. Experts say Myanmar's military could not have gone ahead with a move so grave without the support of China. Uh, you know, the, I don't think the Chinese, for instance, is behind the coup. They may be complicit in not condemning it, um, again, because of reasons for not interference. But ultimately, what China, what India wants is a stable Myanmar, right? Because they have so much economic interest in it, including the Chinese pipeline that runs between, I think, Yunnan and the um, Indian Ocean. You know, the investments that's in there. They also have to be aware of, like, the border area between um, China and Myanmar. You don't want, like, refugees crossing the border into that. So their interest is really in the stability of the country, and it doesn't matter who is running the country. If Myanmar is going to be more stable under a civilian country, then China is happy with it. If it's going to be more stable under the military, then they're happy with it. So I think that is the generous stance. 
And I think that's really um, at the forefront of, of the country's, um, you know, the international community's mind. Like, what is going, what does the security situation mean for themselves and their own borders? That makes sense. Well, then I wanted to ask you, Calvin, just um, what your hopes are for Myanmar's future and sort of the immediate as well as the, the longer term. What are you hoping to kind of see come out of this? The easy answer would be democracy, right? Because um, I, I believe Myanmar never truly really got democracy, even after the NLD won. Uh, for, for instance, in the 2015 elections, uh, even after the NLD won, they were forced to work under the uh, 2008 constitution's framework. And, and, that is, and that is not a democracy. It is just, I, I saw this um, post on social media and analysis. And it was it was it captured what I wanted to say greatly. It said, Myanmar. What the military did was uh, allowed people to think. They 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 got the true taste of democracy, which which stripped people of political awareness for a few years, and to and for them to just take away everything overnight. That's that's the hardest blow the military can do to its civilians, for people to think their voices matter uh, one night and the next night, it, it no longer does. So I, I don't think that's the situation anyone wants to go back to, and that's certainly not what I want for Myanmar as well. We need a democracy that's that actually takes uh, people's voices, ethnic voices, into account as well. And so, so which leads to my um, next hope for the country, uh, more inclusivity for ethnic minorities as well, uh, for Myanmar to actually embrace and acknowledge the cultural, the cultural diversity and pluralism that is present in the country. I believe anyone trying to say that Myanmar is, is, is like Myanmar's ethnic minorities don't matter is, is just in denial and, and does not matter if if they are against or for the military, if they say that, if they think that, I think they are in some way repeating uh, military-fostered propaganda and ideas. And such ideas, such kind of political culture, is something I wish to see gone. And and lastly, uh, this this is what I always say to to my friends: we need to reconstruct the the idea of national unity in Myanmar. Under, under a more federal and inclusive framework. Because national unity, what people know, is that the union of Burma must stay together. When they, when they hear talks about ethnic minorities, all they know is that they are unruly rebels, right? They're trying to break away from the country. What would, what would that look like for, for Myanmar? Does that mean Myanmar is only going to be left with you know, central Myanmar? Like, what are these ethnic groups going to do to our country? That's the that's the mis uh, that's the misconception that they hold, and and yet they make that misconception on the idea based on the idea of national unity. They want Myanmar to stay together, but for Myanmar to stay together, they have to take ethnic demands into account. And I wish after this after this entire resistance, if or when we win, the better would be when when we win people have to start understanding why ethnic minorities and their demands matter in this new federal arrangement. If we do not take that into account, it does not matter if we if we fight 20 years for democracy, I don't think we'll truly taste, uh, we'll truly get to see Myanmar as a, a, a democratic union. Mm-hmm. And actually, I wanted to just ask a quick follow-up to that. Um, you were talking about sort of the demands of various ethnic minorities for federalism, et cetera. Were those, was any progress being made on that front um, under Aung San Suu Kyi before the coup? Honestly, no, because there was, there was a lot of negligence uh, regarding ethnic demands. And that, that's certainly why many ethnic uh, parties, ethnic uh, uh, armed groups are are hesitant to to cooperate with the CRPH, right? The, currently, even though the CRPH um, uh, produces federal charter to, in a sense, woo um, 
the, the ethnic parties. There's, there's still lots of hesitancy uh, on the ethnic part. And we can't really just blame the NLD, though. They, they, yes, for sure, they, their policies did not really uh, take ethnic uh, voices into account all the time. But it's years of mistrust, hostility, and, 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 and hostility towards state institutions, right? Towards the state government. And we have to take that into account, coupled with, with the uh, NLD's very weak um, uh, attempts to reconcile with the ethnic minorities. That is why uh, Myanmar is, remains so divided when it comes to politics, when it comes to uh, ethnic reconciliation. Some people think it's worth pursuing, some people think it's not. But what I can say for certain, though, after this, after, after the coup and, and during this democratic movement is people do realize that ethnic minorities cannot be out of the picture for, for Myanmar. Absolutely. Um, well, we're sort of getting to, I guess, the end of our session today. I don't want to keep you guys too long, but I was just wondering if people who want to get more involved, especially um, students, of course, um, how can they sort of uh, make their voice heard or, or get involved in this movement? So our our students' coalition around BC, um, we, we are on Facebook, we are on Twitter and Instagram as well. And we are in in touch with uh, lots of other uh, uh, groups. That's that's not not only in Canada but also in the U.S. So if you are if if somebody is interested in in advocacy work or just n- nothing complicated, just just helping us manage a social media page, right, or or, or creating content, creating posters, uh, people are welcome to message us. It's it's I know it's Myanmar Students Coalition, but recently we have. We have tried to uh, we have we've encouraged people who are who are Canadian. We've asked people to join us because because this movement is not just about Myanmar in a sense. Like what's happening in Myanmar is is just a glimpse of a, a greater uh, problem in the world with 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 uh, authoritarianism, right? And we've we are in touch with uh, Hong Kong youth groups as well. So if you if any anyone uh, wants to get started with advocacy, you're welcome to reach us via Facebook, via Instagram, via Twitter. And again, uh, it's called Myanmar Students Coalition BC. Yep. Thank you both, um, Isabel and Calvin, so much for talking to us today. And to our listeners, we'll uh, we'll catch you next time. <laughs> Thank you so Thank much. You. Thanks, everyone.